Okay, so it's uh, 10.05, so I think we're going to get started. We'll probably have a couple people uh, join in as we go, uh, but we want to get the, the webinar going. Uh, so first off, I want to thank everybody for registering and attending our webinar. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, the webinar is scheduled for an hour and a half, uh, but we intend to keep you informed and plenty entertained. Um, so I guess to start, we'll start with some introductions. Um, I, will, I will get the ball rolling. Uh, my name is Brian Penfold, uh, the picture on the left. Uh, and I'm a manager here at STI, managing the Air Quality and Exposure Science Division. And I'm also the eSIMS product manager at, at STI. So, Justin? And my name is Justin Dumas. I am a meteorologist here at STI. I've been with STI for about a year and a half now. And on the Eastern's team, I serve as the technical support expert. So Brian will get uh, going here. And just as a friendly reminder that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, after today. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Uh, yeah, so the webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our website, esims.sonomatech.com. Um, and then a couple of other notes before we get started. Uh, your call-in lines are all muted uh, during the webinar, but we encourage you to use uh, the questions and chat feature uh, within, the, within the webinar software to type any questions that you might have throughout the process, uh, throughout the process of the webinar. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer section at the end of the presentation as time allows. Uh, however, we'll make all the questions and answers available to you uh, in the coming days as as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. So to start, let's go through today's uh, agenda for the webinar. Um, we're going to begin with kind of the big picture. Um, uh, you know, how society is moving to electronic systems, everything from purchasing transactions to legally defensible products, uh, or if you're like me, uh, seeing your four-year-old daughter. Uh, navigate and use your iPhone, um, which is both uh, impressive and scary all at the same time. Um, so then we're going to go into the EPA guidance document uh, shown here on the slide, uh, which I'm sure uh, you have all uh, are familiar with or have have read. Um, and we're going to go through the required components of what EPA considers for an e-logbook system. Uh, so then we're going to jump into uh, our product, uh, eSIMS, and eSIMS says an STI logbook system that's designed to address uh, EPA's requirements, uh, ease the transition for you, the air agencies, to electronic system, and really, most importantly, increase you know, productivity and efficiencies within your monitoring operations activities. So after that, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, with a question and answer section. OK, so let's, let's get started. So, uh, like I said, like I showed before, here's the, the EPA guidance document for which I know uh, was, re was released uh, almost a year ago. Um, and I know you have all probably seen or have read uh, this document. But uh, really what we wanted to highlight first was kind of the opening paragraph uh, of this guidance document and the emphasis EPA has put on, you know, the increasing use of electronic information really in today's world, in today's society. Um, and right off the bat, the first, the first sentence in, in, in the guidance document is the use and storage of electronic information is increased at an even faster pace within our environment. So um, as you can imagine, you know, where electronic, uh, electronic transactions are occurring via smartphones, um, really uh, on, a, on a daily basis, everything from smartphone technology to, you know, legally binding signatures. Uh, for which I'm sure you're all familiar with, if you were like me who just did their taxes online this past month, uh, have, have instituted some of this technology into, into your tax program. So then going forward, you know, kind of getting more into, into, our, age, into our industry, and the, the real-time ambient data is now being uh, posted and is available on PCs, on smartphones, for, for both agency staff to use for analysis, as well as just the general public. And it's really, really becoming um, a useful tool to get the information that we work so hard as a, in the air quality industry out to, to the public uh, to educate them. And then really that data is, that, that is going out to the public is collected and verified and validated electronically. 
Uh, we have the sophisticated equipment uh, that you guys use, that we use for, for developing and collecting that data and getting it out uh, to, the, to the real world applications. So really what, what uh, and just to, we'll, we'll get into this in a little more detail in just a second, but really what we're seeing and what the EPA is starting to realize with the development of this guidance document is the fact that around the air quality agency as a whole, the air quality industry as a whole, where we're seeing the biggest gap in technology advances is really in uh, the, the uh, electronic of uh, the logbook uh, formats and the scenarios generated around those. This document, uh, for the purpose of establishing the minimum requirements for documenting, documenting, maintaining uh, electronic logbook information, and to ensure that, e that data captured is maintained in a secure, tamper-proof, in really legally defensible manner. We're just checking that the chat functions to make sure everybody's hearing us okay, and then I'm going to pass it over to Justin, and he's going to walk you through a couple more slides here. Okay, so continuing on the theme of everyone and everything moving to an electronic system, the air quality arena has been and is heading this way. And we know this because our air quality and meteorology networks are using some of the most high-tech, sophisticated equipment in the world. Slide here. Uh, and for example, for instrumentation, you know, we have complex PM samplers now, like the Teledyne API T640X, that can sample both PM 2.5 and PM 10 at the same time. Or if you've ever worked with gaseous analyzers, you know, they're using sophisticated methods and uh, chemical reactions to tease out and measure certain pollutants. As well as like communication networks and equipment, logging and sending data over cell and Wi-Fi networks now. And of course, our day-to-day -day activities with data QC and analysis. We're using programs and scripts to crunch data more efficiently and more effectively. So passing back, back over to Brian to discuss some of the EPA minimum requirements now that we've uh, found in that document. Yeah, thanks, Justin. And like Justin said, so, you know, we're, as an air quality, in the air quality arena, we're definitely moving in the direction of advanced technology. And really the next component to what we see and what EPA, EPA sees is making that jump is the e-logbook section. So in order to kind of achieve this, EPA has listed several requirements in an, an e-logbook system should meet within their guidance document. The requirements listed here are based off the National Archives and Records Administration, as well as EPA's website entitled Basic Requirements of the Electronic Record Keeping System at EPA. So these requirements include a variety of things. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them uh, here. Uh, to begin, uh, integrity of records and ensuring a system security through user-defined password authentication process is a really important feature. Um, going into regular backups of the entire system to really safeguard any uh, against any loss of information. In addition to backups, having a co-located system or essentially kind of an off-site copy of your database to serve as an additional recovery mechanism uh, for, for the system. In addition to the backups, uh, one of the big components of the EPA guidance document is organization delegation and accessibility, or having multiple levels of access or permissions based off of the varied personnel within your organization. So just continuing with some of the requirements listed in the guidance document, uh, migration and, and, and retention of records in a standard and consistent format uh, for the duration of time determined by the organization is a key component uh, for, for an e-logbook system. Uh, next, uh, the second bullet here, having the ability to audit your system, uh, whether it be an internal audit with your staff or an external audit of, of your overall system and the data within it. And then uh, the last, lastly, the one I wanted to touch on, which we consider one of the more important functions or important requirements within the guidance document, is the information security, uh, data entry, 
within the system. And those requirements we consider uh, a chain of the chain of custody uh, in that the system needs to be able to maintain the original records as well as track and log any and all related activity within the system. So a phrase that we often use and we'll probably you'll probably hear more of uh, within Justin's uh, live demonstration of the software of our software is really um, having the ability to track and record the who, the what, the when, uh, and the where and the why of all your activity related in, uh, related to uh, your e-logbook system. Okay, so uh, that just uh, that just highlights kind of the the, the minimum requirements uh, in in kind of a nutshell, and we're going to get into more of those details as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, but really, what I wanted to focus on now was, um, you know, EPA has developed this guidance document. Uh, we know that there's, uh, from a technology standpoint, there's a gap in in e logbooks related to the, the the rest of the monitoring program activity and technology. But really, what are the other uh, drawbacks or challenges agencies uh, like you and and companies like us are facing? When, when dealing with the traditional, the traditional logbooks. So this kind of gets back to the state of the operational record keeping and where it stands in this level of technology. Uh, and as you can see here in the highlighted section of the EPA guidance document describing the common problems associated with traditional logbooks. And since you all know, since you've all registered for this webinar and are spending your valuable time to listen to us, you probably have already seen or have had to deal with a lot of these same challenges that we have listed here. Uh, and those include, uh, you know, paper log books being uh, unaccessible or sometimes they're damaged or lost. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to quickly resolve problems, especially when your network is, is spanning, you know, a large geographic area and you need, you need to get access to site information uh, quickly. Um, and, you know, really, uh, as your network grows or becomes more diverse, which a lot of networks are across the country, it's becoming more and more difficult to track your equipment, track your repairs, uh, track your um, your field staff scheduling uh, capabilities, and where where everybody is uh, on a daily basis. And really, overall, there's just a, a growing disconnect between you know the field activity and then your office-based management of of your network. So that. I, what I really wanted to do next was uh, kind of get you a little more engaged and, inter and interact with you uh, as best we can in a webinar format. So uh, we set up a uh, just a, a really simple poll question, um, and I'm going to launch that right now so you guys can see that. Uh, and it's really just you know kind of getting the information from you on what are the types of things that you are 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 facing with traditional logbooks. Um, and the poll question is really easy. It's multiple choice. Um, but if there's if there's things on the list that you don't that you're that you're struggling with that we don't have listed here, please uh, use the questions box and and provide that information. We'd love to we'd love to hear about uh, what you guys are facing and um, and how you know uh, an e logbook system can hopefully kind of address those needs. question that's so we'll probably give you about 30 seconds to complete that poll and then uh, please go ahead and use the questions box into any other comments or thoughts you may have about that and then we'll go ahead and, and return back to the, uh, the webinar it's only only allowing us to do the poll or the webinar one at a time Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do some uh, live uh, polling here. Uh, so it seems like the majority of the folks on the phone, um, the the biggest problem that we're seeing is is data availability without having to travel to the site, and that that is one that we definitely focus that we definitely struggle with with the most. Um, and right up there, right up next to that is uh, difficult, uh, hard uh, hard to track and review and store 
the backup information related to the to the traditional law book. So uh, I think I, I think uh, you know because all of us are on this webinar, uh, I think we're all on, really on the same page with what uh, the typical challenges are with 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 traditional law books, uh, and I should say traditional law books as well as standalone instrument forms, uh, basically systems that are are disconnected to the overall management and connectivity of, of the monitoring program. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll question, and we can we can kind of keep the ball rolling. But again, if you have any additional questions or information that you want to that you want to um, provide related to that, feel free to use the questions box, and we can take a look at that uh, uh, in the question and answer section. Okay, so. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we're all having uh, issues with the traditional law books and whether those issues can be varied quite a bit. Um, but as a consulting as a consulting company, we've uh, we've faced the same challenges as most modern agencies have uh, with with traditional law books. Um, we're an air quality consulting company that's been it's on its 34th year of business now. So we've been tasked with countless monitoring projects. Uh, whether they be short-term intensive monitoring projects or uh, long-term uh, complete network operation management contracts, uh, STI managers and field technicians really have faced a lot of these same uh, these same challenges. So, to really combat those, uh, back in 2011, uh, we built an internal e-logbook system, and we called it eSIMS. So uh, what is ESIM? So ESIMS is really designed to bridge the gap between our field activity and our office-based air quality network uh, operations management. Uh, and more importantly, it allowed us to kind of streamline the data collection, the data accessibility, uh, and the personnel scheduling and staffing for our projects, for our monitoring projects. So as ESIM became, became kind of an integral component of our monitoring operations, we were starting to see benefits in the forms of increased efficiencies, record keeping, uh, data quality, uh, inventory control, uh, really, and all of which really kind of began generating cost savings and efficiencies. Uh, so we, we began to realize that this would really be a useful tool for agencies across the country to, to, to utilize. So as such, uh, STI made a considerable investment to develop kind of a larger platform and in infrastructure based off of our internal tool, along with the, some more feature enhancements and tools to create, uh, really to, to allow, to create a system that will allow the same benefits to be used for agencies like, like yourself. So, so what is eSIMS? Um, eSIMS is a web-based system. Uh, that allows you to easily log, document, track, schedule all of your instrument maintenance, repairs, audits, uh, your site uh, instrument uh, attribute information, your equipment information, really you, basically your, your entire activity of your network in one centralized location. So uh, in just a few minutes, I'm going to pass it over to Justin, and he's going to walk you through some of the key benefits and features of the system. But the one thing that I did want to highlight here is that eSIMS is a web-based system. So uh, it's accessible on any type of device. So whether you're in the office and, and you're accessing the system from a desktop PC, or if you're in the field using a, lab, uh, a laptop or a tablet or even a smartphone, is able to stay connected with what's going on within your agency's monitoring operations. So as you, can, as you can imagine, designing this system um, or building up the infrastructure from our internal tool, uh, air, air agencies to, to transition away from traditional law books to an e-logbook system was a pretty large undertaking. So uh, basically what we wanted to do was we wanted to build a system that would address you know, the, the multiple uh, needs and requirements that agencies were would require for 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 making that tra transition to an e-logbook system. So really, the best way that we did that, and the the most effective way, was to 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 uh, solicit feedback and information from agencies really across the country. 
So we spoke with several agencies across the country to help us determine what should be included in eSIMS, how it should function, and what would make it most easy for them to make the transition to electronic system. So as you can see here, we, we, we have a, a fair amount of agencies, really both big and small, uh, from state-level organizations uh, maintaining agent, uh, a monitoring network of you know, nearly 100 sites, down to a city-based organization that may have you know, just a handful of sites. And really being able to understand what were the, the needs and challenges that these agencies are facing and the needs and requirements that an e-logbook system would need to have in order for them to really make that jump. So in particular here, I just wanted to highlight that you can see EPA, uh, the EPA logo right in the bottom corner here, is on the list. Um, so we were fortunate enough really to be developing eSIMS as EPA was developing the recently released guidance document. So we were really able to solicit feedback from them, uh, much of which is associated with the minimum requirements that we discussed earlier, and Justin will go into in more detail in just a second as well as feedback from other agencies that allowed us to design and develop a system to really what, what eSIMS is today. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Justin, and he's going to walk you through, uh, starting to walk you through some of the software. So now that we have a concept of what eSIMS is and how it was developed, we can start looking at some of the actual benefits of using the system. So first and foremost, of course, it's password protected, only allowing agency approved users access to data and information, and really preventing the tampering uh, of unauthorized users. And of course, this meets one of the EPA requirements for e-logbooks. It has a robust chain of custody system built in. So as Brian mentioned, we always know the who, what, where, when, and why a change or update was made in the system, which is also an EPA requirement. And since all staff will be following the same procedures using the same e-log forms and the same e-log book, you'll have improved data quality with a greater consistency across the network. In addition, eSIMS creates a quick centralized access point for all staff. So anyone in the network will be able to reach these data and information anywhere, anytime with the click of a button. And as Brian mentioned, whether using a desktop, laptop, computer, tablet, or a smart device out in the field. And the last bullet here is stating that eSIMS will be attractive to upcoming tech, uh, tech savvy employees. The idea is that this will be a type of tool that millennials will use as opposed to older paper logbook methods. And really you can use eSIMS to attract those top notch candidates to your team. So just right off the bat, we have some initial overview type benefits that we've seen using eSIMS and that we feel that others will benefit from as well. But now I want to jump into eSIMS as software as a service. So the eSIMS package is not just access to the system for your daily usage. There's an entire operations and support service that comes along with it. And for example, EPA's Air Now, Air Now program. Some of you may know uh, that STI manages and operates the Air Now Data Management Center, uh, receiving and aggregating data from thousands of monitoring sites around the world every single hour. So we've gotten the operations, including backups, maintenance, and security down to the science, and we have the proven capacity to operate a system on that scale. Uh, but in addition to that, we also host and, and manage a number of air quality websites in addition to our own data collected through our field operations. And looking at some more of the software as a service benefits here, uh, first and foremost, the system security and data backups. So SCI hosts a system and database, and really that relieves your IT staff of all the stresses and headaches that come along with maintaining the software. And of course, we uh, perform the routine data backups, also uh, one of the EPA requirements. And then as I mentioned about uh, that we uh, operate and host the EPA's Air Now program. And then the last bullet there, that data are retained indefinitely. So the bottom line here, what we, want to, what we want to ingrain here is that you'll always have access to your data at any time. And then a few more bonus points here from the software as a service is the ongoing technical support. So if there's ever an issue that comes up or if you ever have any questions, uh, feel free to give us a call or send us an email. Uh, and as the tech lead here, the tech support lead here, I'll probably be the one uh, who would pick up the phone for you. 
Uh, next, we have transition assistance with staff training. And, and Brian will talk about this a little bit as he goes into the after the demo here. But as far as the transition goes, we understand that it's a major change to go from a paper logbook system or Excel files or access database to an e-system such as eSIMS. So we have thorough staff training sessions with access to pre-recorded how-to videos and even offer on-site training to make sure everyone is up to speed as you hit the ground running with the system. And to build off of the eSIM software as a service model, the idea is that the system is open to continuous feature enhancements. And what I mean by this is that SCI will be continually upgrading the system to include new tools and features, but there will also be improvements as new agencies come on board. Uh, for example, one of our first clients, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, they really wanted an inventory tracking system in eSIMS. And that was on our feature list, wish list of things that we wanted to build too, but it wasn't high up on our food chain or what, it wasn't next on the docket to, to be developed. So they actually funded the inventory tracking system to be built in their development cycle, and now it's in the system and available for all users. So the bottom line is the system will continue to grow as more agencies come on board and bring more tools to the table here. And then the last bullet, uh, user community crosstalk and collaboration. This is something that we've brainstormed and we're still looking for feedback on this, so feel free to drop a mention of this in the questions or comments section on the webinar. But we want to develop a forum or a public section separate from your data where users can post tech notes and tips and tricks about certain instruments and really opening a line of communication across all the eSIMS users to share information. So the idea is maybe if you're troubleshooting, you know, repairing an instrument and it wasn't in the manual and you weren't able to work with the instrument's tech support to resolve the issue and you finally figured it out and you have some, some how-to notes or a video you took, you could potentially post that on the eSIMS forum for others to see and almost use it as an additional resource. So that's something that we're moving towards as the software grows and we're looking for continual feedback on that. So now I want to jump into how eSIMS meets the EPA requirements. And really to come for a full circle here, we've dabbled and covered some of this material so far. But to finally get to the point, since we were able to develop a lot of eSIMS as EPA guidance was coming out, we've been able to build in all of these measures to meet EPA's minimum requirements for e-logbooks with the only edge case of e-signatures, which I'll talk about here shortly. So just to pick out some of these requirements that are on this page here, starting with integrity and backup, just as a reminder, our database is routinely backed up and the system is password protected. For metadata and identity, of course, chain of custody is tracked, as well as each detail down to the individual instrument component and serial numbers. And then for accessibility, you know, any agency can have an unlimited number of eSIMS users. So this will allow all types of staff no matter the role, access to the system and where the administrators and managers can control the privileges and access for each user and each type of action. So moving on and looking at a second page of these requirements for EPA's e-logbooks here. First we have information security and locking and then the data revision and correction. And just to highlight here, once an entry is made and saved, it's stored in the eSIMS database forever. And eSIMS has a section visually documenting whenever a value is altered so we can maintain the same original information or previous values if you were to make a change. And this is sort of to mimic as if you were with a paper logbook, right? If you were in a paper logbook and uh, wrote something down and wanted to make a change, you would strike through it with your pen or pencil and then uh, you know, make the change and sign next to it. And you'll see in the software demonstration how our change log mimics and documents that exact same process. And the last item I want to mention on this slide here is e-signatures. And this is sort of our edge case that I mentioned before. And simply, we're just waiting for more guidance from EPA, EPA on this. Uh, they've suggested using e-signatures within the logbook process that need to be utilized. You know, what we need sort of that specific information on how exactly it needs to be implemented into the system. And we've done our research and we're aware that EPA recommends the Chrome Air system 
for e-signatures, but as soon as we get more information on this, we'll implement e-signatures into e-SIMS as soon as possible. So what I'd like to do now is move on to the software demonstration of eSIM. So we'll probably spend about another half an hour and just briefly do an overview of the system. But really, we've covered a lot of information so far and crammed a lot into the first half an hour here. So as I pull up the software, just take a moment or two to jot down any questions you have so far, whether it about you know be about the EPA requirements or anything else, or pop them in the question section, and we'll be able to review those a little bit later on. Okay, okay. So we're going to go ahead and do a quick uh, software demonstration here today. And first, before I get started, I want to highlight the user roles and accessibility portion and feature of eSIMS and remind you that there are different user roles built into the software that have access to different tools and different features. And so for the demo today, I'm going to log in under my account, which is currently set as the highest level of access. So we'll kind of see it through the manager's or administrator's eyes and get the sense and feel on how they would use the software. But really, eSIMS is quite in depth, and I could talk about this for a couple hours, for those of you that may have seen this before. So Really, for the time that we have today, I think it would be best to walk through the system in sort of a scenario base as if we were a field operator out in the field getting ready to conduct uh, a field activity. But I'll go ahead and, and mix in some of the manager administrator roles and so we can kind of see both sides of the coin as we get going in here. So the idea is that staff would go ahead and navigate to eSIMS in the web browser, and then this would be the login screen here and they'd have their account already set up and they can go ahead and sign in. So I'll sign in under my account right now. Okay, so once we sign in, the first page that we're gonna see here is the dashboard. And really this is just a high level overview of all the activity happening across the network. For the sake of the demo today, I have uh, entered in just some basic sites and equipment for sites under the California Air Resources Board. Again, this is just sort of dummy data that we can use as we walk through our demo today. Right off the bat here on the top right hand side, we see the site map, and this is going to show us a list of all sites throughout the entire network. This map has all the powers of Google Maps, so we can zoom in, we can zoom out. We have street view as well as some different layers and labels that we can apply here. To the left of the map, we have a list of all the upcoming scheduled activities happening across the network. All of these items here can be scheduled through the scheduler, which I'll touch base a little, uh, little bit later on. Uh, but you can see for each one of these items here, we have the site, who the technician is, what type of activity, and then what particular parameter or piece of equipment. But we also notice the colored circles next to each one of these items. And this corresponds to the task priority. So when you schedule these items to the scheduler, you can assign a priority based on the level of attention that they require. So, you know, for routine calibration and maintenance, a routine site visit, you can schedule that as a low priority. So in that case, the Visalia site was going to show up as a green dot here on the map. But if you have an urgent repair or an important audit coming up, you can schedule it as a medium or high priority. In that case, the site is going to show up as either a yellow or red dot on the map. So the idea is here as a manager, you can sign in you know, as a field manager, and right off the bat, you have a status of all the planned activities across your network, and you get a good sense of what's in the docket for the day or the next week, and what are the high priority items that we need to focus on. But for our scenario today, for this kind of uh, simulated thing we're going to walk through, from the field operator perspective, we can see on my docket today, I have a site visit to do a calendar maintenance on a BAM 1020 at the Black Bio site. And these are the things we're going to go through today for our simulated experience. So uh, just to highlight a, more, a couple more features on the dashboard before moving into our scenario, if we scroll down, again, we just see some high-level information happening across the network. On the far left-hand side, we have latest task reports. This is going to show a panel of all of our completed uh, reports recently. They could be your calibrations, your maintenance, your audits, your repairs, all those are going to show up here. 
In the middle, we have monitoring site activity log. This is going to show a list of any changes or updates to site information or site metadata or any kind of activities carried out at a particular site. And then on the far right, we have inventory activity log, which is a similar story. It's going to show any changes or updates to inventory information or metadata or any kind of activities carried out on any one single piece of equipment. And the terminology inventory, we chose that for a reason. And we're not just referring to PM samplers and ozone analyzers. This could be any kind of equipment that's stationed or utilized throughout your entire network. So shelters, cell modems, pumps, trailers, air conditioners, all of that can be entered into eSIMS and tracked through our inventory tracking system. And as we go through the, the demo here, we'll, we'll kind of see how that works and see how that plays out through the rest of the system. You know, get a good idea of all the different bells and whistles that come along with that. And something that we mentioned during our slides at the beginning of the, of the presentation, as well as during the EPA requirements, is the robust chain of custody. And you can see that through each one of these items here. Uh, the field operator or ESIM's user name and time and date is all visually recorded and stamped here. So if we ever wanted to go back and trace back whenever a change was made in the system, we can always go see who did what and follow up with the correct staff if we ever have any questions or need to trace back our steps. All right, so for our scenario today, I said we're going to do a calibration site visit on our BAM 1020 here at the Visalia site. So let's just pretend that I'm a field operator and you know, maybe it's been a while since I've gone to this site, maybe it's been about a month or so, or this isn't a site that I usually work with, and I just want to get a sense of what's been happening there lately, you know, what's been going on with this particular site, this particular BAM, you know, who's been there recently, and, and what I can expect when I show up on site. So, to get some more information about this site, I could look here through our site activity panel here and see what's been going on. Or I can go over to the sites tab here. And when we click on sites, this is going to bring us to a list of all sites throughout our entire network. We have the region category here. And region is just an optional category. Um, if your agency is sort of a smaller subcomponent of a larger agency, you can use that here just for some categorization. Or if your agency is divided up into different regions and different counties or sectors, you could also uh, divide up your network that way too. Then of course we have all of our sites here. We have an AQS uh, or site ID and then the last time the site uh, was visited. But also notice that we have a warehouse uh, site entered in here. And you know, this is where we're going to store all of our spare parts, spare components, bench testing equipment, our lab. And keep that in mind that you know this isn't designed just for your field sites. This could be everything you have stationed at your central office uh, or in your warehouse or lab or oper operations as well. So here's off our side of the site here we're going to check out today. So if we click on this, this will bring us to the site details page for this site. And right off the bat, we just have some basic details here, our region, name, site code, AQS code, address, county, lat long, and start date. And then to the right here, we have a list of all of our recent activities. And so I could use this to kind of trace back and, and see what's been happening lately at the site. If you scroll down, we have some more optional details here. And we can see air base and elevation lease owner access and comments. And we see access and comments being uh, pretty popular so far. This is where you can store all the information for who's got the keys, you know, who's got the combination lock. What do you do when you get on site? Who to contact? Where to park property boundaries? And this makes it easy now that any staff, whether it be field operator or manager, can come into eSIMS and be up to date in a matter of seconds about you know, the operations and the go-to details for what you do when you get on site. And then to kind of take that a step further, you know, remember that we have the address uh, right up here in the site details. And remember that the site map on the dashboard has Google Maps. So essentially, if you know I'm a new tech or I haven't been here in a while, I could pop this address into the Google Maps, and bam, I could have directions of how to get to the site and you know estimated time travel in just a matter of a few clicks. So we've tried to build a lot of these tools within these sims to make not only the field operator you know life easier, but also from the manager perspective as well. 
And then last year, I want to touch on is just the inventory panel here in the bottom right. And this is going to list any of the equipment that's stationed at the site. So just from the site page view here, we can automatically see, you know, what are the equipment that's stationed there. And in our case, here is our BAM 1020 that's measuring PM 2.5. This is going to be the instrument that we're going to be working on today. Okay. So let's jump back to the dashboard. And now that we're sort of up to date on our site, we know what's been happening. We know how to get there on site. We know all the details. We know the equipment that we're going to service today. Now let's go ahead and take a closer look at the BAM 1020 so we can get a feel for what's been happening with this particular instrument and check on the status to make sure that it's good to go if there's any actions that we need to make sure we're going to cover today. So uh, to, to do that, we'd go ahead and click on Inventory. And this is going to bring us to a list of all equipment and inventory stations throughout the entire network. And you can imagine here, again, this is just some dummy data that I've entered into the system, but you can imagine throughout your entire network, you're going to have lots of stuff. You know, you're going to have three, 400, or maybe even 500 pieces of equipment. So we've built this advanced filter feature at the top here to where you can narrow down your inventory by any one of these categories here. And you can even see manufactured, purchased, certified and price or cost of instruments. And these details really feed into the inventory tracking system feature that I had mentioned earlier. And I'll go ahead and jump back into this in just a few minutes and it'll make more sense. But just keep that in mind that you can essentially filter down your entire list by any one of these categories and then also export it as a CSV or Excel as well. And so we'll talk about that in just a few minutes here. So to hone in on our BAM 1020 for the example today, uh, we can see that it's right here, but I can also use the search bar. If we're trying to search for a ton of equipment, we could just you know, type in BAM, and then right away here, this is our first instrument here at the Visalia site. We can go ahead and click on this. And now we're looking at the details page dedicated to this individual piece of equipment. Uh, just to kind of run you guys through some of these uh, titles and categories here, we have category. So we can see it's scheduled or determined as an instrument. Uh, however, you can have an, you know, a gas analyzer, a gas calibrator. It could be an individual component of the BAM, so maybe a down tube or a hood or a pump. You have a consumable, so maybe you know, you're entering BAM tape into your network. Uh, you have your meta instruments, and then you have obviously your handheld reference devices like your Delta Cal or Tri Cal. So any type of equipment that you're using in your network can be categorized and you know, uh, set to a particular type. And of course, you have your name, manufacturer model, serial number, or if you have your internal inventory number, we have the site that it's currently stationed at. But then we have the status. And this is going to start getting into the inventory tracking system feature here. And then we can see that right now it's currently set to active. So it's, we know that it's sampling out in the field. And this is something that I would be looking for as a field operator coming to the site, wanting to check to make sure that this is the correct instrument we're going to be working on and that it's an active piece of equipment. And I can open up this drop-in to show you that there are different options, uh, such as broken. So maybe if the instrument was in the warehouse uh, awaiting parts, and we're, you know, we want to set it that it's a broken piece of equipment. Uh, it could be in repair. It could be out in the field. We're you know, heading at the site to replace some parts. Uh, it could be a retired instrument. We're going to go ahead and scrap for parts. Or it could be a spare altogether. Maybe it's a consumable like BAM tape, and you want to declare that it's a spare item. Opening inventory details, again, we have some more information here. So data manufacturer, data purchase, data certification. And we even have a section here where you can scan in and upload your certification document. And then that way you always know that your device is good to go and ready to be used out in the field. Uh, we see this being super handy here with your handheld reference devices, right? So all of your uh, calibration flow meters and things like that can be, you know, the certification can be scanned in and uploaded. And that way you have a handy reference on the field, always knowing that you know, you're good to go and that you're good to continue using your equipment. And then, of course, we have the cost right here. So below that, we have quantity and reorder threshold. And we can see we have a quantity of one. So we know that there's only one BAM in the world that exists with this particular serial number. You know, there's only one that, they, that MET1 has ever created and made. But we really see this being handy with some more of our consumable items. So items such as BAM tape. So we continue this BAM theme going. I'm going to go ahead and pull up a page dedicated to BAM tape. And we can get a look on how that would work. So 
I'll go ahead and fix the BAM tape here. And you can see we have an oh, entry right here stored at our warehouse as a spare item. So if we click on this and we open up our inventory details for this page, for this example here we see there's a quantity of 10 on the shelf in the warehouse, right, with a reorder threshold of 2. So let's say it's been 60 days and we're going to go ahead and replace BAM tape and a number of our samplers. And so a few of the techs go in the warehouse and grab a few rolls off the shelf. And now we're at, you know, we're down to, let's say they grab nine rolls, and now we're down to just one roll of tape left. Well, that meets our reorder threshold criteria. And when we save this page, it's going to send an email notification to users, letting them know that, hey, we're running low on this particular item, and then it's time to order more. And within that email, we'll include all of these notes right here. So you can see I've entered some part numbers and some uh, contact information from MET1. And so right away we have all the reorder information we need to you know, keep our components and consumables in stock. And that way, you know, both as a field manager and as a field operator, uh, your network will stay in, in good shape and nothing will fall through the cracks. Okay, just one more component I want to talk about here in inventory and tracking system and then we'll go ahead and jump back into our simulated scenario. And that's this component details section here. And really what this does, this allows you to visually see how the instrument is grouped with different components out in the field. So we know we have this overall instrument uh, of the BAM 1020. We know it's out there sampling. But we know it works with a bunch of other moving parts and pieces that make up this one whole entire unit. We know it's got a down tube. We know it's got a hood. We know it's got a heater maybe and a pump and an air conditioner and a shelter. So what this does, this allows you to group and build all the individual components that make up this dam so you know all the pieces that are working together. So if you ever need to troubleshoot you know, what data logger it's working with and what serial number or any of that information, all that is going to be in one place here in ESAM. You don't have to go back and, and backtrack and look through a bunch of different Excel files to see you know, where it is and what's going on. And essentially, you would just look through this available section here and bring it over to the associated section. So of course, we have our overarching BAM 1020 here. But if we look for, we can find our, we drag that, drop it over. And we're essentially building all the different components that make up this one entire working unit. And so we see that being super handy for things like our MET towers, right, our 10-meter MET towers. We have an anemometer. Maybe we have a few temperature probes. We can build out all these different components, and we, still, we know exactly how you know, all the instruments are working together in unison to make one particular uh, working unit. Okay, so now that we have up to date on all of our details here, we know the piece of the focused on is the log forms or the e-log forms we're going to use to perform our field activity with. And so if we go down to the associated log form section here, I, I want to talk about this for just a minute before we, before we actually get into our calibration here, our simulated calibration. And then over the past year or so here at STI, we've been really trying to build our e-log form library and build a number of forms that are really dedicated and specific to an individual instrument and really dial in these forms. Uh, but we've also, on the other hand, made a number of forms that are more universal. So if you wanted to sort of streamline the process across universal forms for more consistency, we have that option here too. And so you can see for each one of the action items in eSIMS, each one of these category field types, we've gone through our, our log form library and picked out the corresponding form for each one of these activities. And so you can see here for our audit and CALS, we have a BAM 3 ATC sheet. We have maintenance for our monthly maintenance, six month maintenance for our other, corrective action for repair, and then our normal site visit, site log for our site visit activity. And so this is just a configuration you would do once when the instrument is set up and you're ready to go and you're ready to start using these forms out in the field. But we also have this offline template section right here down below. So we recognize that there could be some sites outside of internet access and maybe there's not a cell reception there, or the site does not have Wi-Fi, there's not a computer there at site, and you're going to need internet. So this offline mode function allows 
of eSIMs in areas with so for example at this connection I would go ahead and build these offline form templates tablet or smart device and I would pretty much go out in the field and complete the log form with these CSV versions here. And then once I get back into the office at the end of the day, I would upload these completed templates into eSIMS and they sync into the database automatically. So this is one way to still use eSIMS out in the field and really use the e-logbook feature even though you may be in an area without internet connection. Okay. So let's jump back to the dashboard. So now that we're up to date on our site, we're up to date on our piece of equipment, we're ready to go ahead and complete our field cal as if we were already there at site. So we'll pretend that we pulled up here at the site and we pulled up ESIM as we logged in, and now we're ready to go ahead and start using uh, the system here for our field cal. So what we would do is the field operator would go click on task, pick out calibration, and this brings us to a blank calibration report page. There are just some basic details here that the technician would complete. Uh, we'd pick our site, pick our individual piece of equipment. We have uh, calibration already chosen. And then we have technician here. And we can see that this is grayed out. So I actually can't change this because I'm signed in under my account. And this is really going to preserve that chain of custody to where I can't do work under Brian's name. Brian can't do work under my name. This is really going to keep everything in line so we always know who's doing what uh, in the network and, and, and storing it properly in Ethan. If we scroll down, we actually get into our BAM QAQC sheet. And so here we have our reference section. We pick out our handheld, let's see, our flow meter. We're going to use a Delta Cal today for each one of these items here. Uh, obviously, we're not concerned with arch and wind. If we were working with a MET tower or an anemometer, we'd want to go ahead and complete these details. Uh, and first, we see the as found section. So right, these are going to be all of the fields we would complete as if we were just to walk up to the instrument. Uh, just sort of the basic uh, you know, details about what we're, what we're seeing as we get up to the instrument. We also notice this little colored little graph icon next to each one of these items. And what this is, if we click on this, let's just click on the flow. This pulls up all of the previous uh, historical values for this parameter over time. So right away, as a field operator, I can get a quick pulse of the instrument to see how the flow's been operating. So I kind of know what I'm getting into and, and, and sort of know the heartbeat of the instrument, especially if I haven't been here in a while and I want to see how it's been operating. So you can view this in a chart format here, or I can choose to view it as a table, and then I can also export it in one of any one of these items here if you want to just want to get some more information out of these things quickly. If I scroll down, we get into the actual cal of the operation here. We have our temperature cal, pressure cal, initial flow verification, flow calibration if needed, uh, final flow verification, leak check. We have some more miscellaneous items here. We have a general comment section. So if you want to enter any information about the overall calibration itself. Uh, of course, we have our as left section. So all the details you would complete uh, before you button up the instrument and before you, you know, fully walk away or drive away from the site. And then we also have an attach file section down here. So let's say maybe you downloaded data from the instrument and you want to go ahead and upload it to this report. You can do that or maybe you took pictures when you got on site or maybe you opened up the shelter and there was a whole new nest of bugs or birds in there. Uh, you can go ahead and document that as well. The one thing that you may have noticed, and I kind of scrolled through quickly, is some of these uh, color coding cells uh, next to some of these items here. And when we built these forms, we tried to do our homework, and any of uh, EPA's requirements for air quality measurements, volume two, I think the handbook, I think it's called the red book, uh, we've acceptance criteria into these log forms were applicable. So like flow verification here, you know, of course, we're going to compare against our design value and then the percent difference between the reference device. So just for kicks here, let's just say our BAM is reading 16.9 liters per minute and our reference device is reading 16.8 liters per minute. Uh, our quick percent difference between the two, we can see we're within our threshold of plus or minus 4 percent and we're within our design value threshold of plus or minus 5 percent. 
But uh, just for kicks here, we can pretend, let's just say our reference is reading 18 liters per minute, and our BAM is reading 15 liters per minute, you know, we're just way out of spec. We can see that, hey, right off the bat, wow, we have some indicators that we need to do some action here. We actually need to do our flow calibration after all, and then we'll go ahead and do another flow verification check after that. So these are really quick handy references to have out in the field, both for new technicians and then also from a manager's perspective to make sure that your staff are following the correct uh, tolerances and specs for all the instruments to keep everything in check and operating as it should. So I think next what it would be the best way to show how these work would be to look at a completed form and look at one of these that's already been finished. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and upload an offline form just for the sake of time here. So uh, just to show how that process would work as if you know we were a tech who came in at the end of the day to upload our offline report, so we just go to the uh, upload an offline section here, go ahead and choose our file. So I'll, I'll navigate to one here, hopefully rather quickly. Uh, wow, it's taking too much time. Would have been easier to put this on the desktop, huh, Brian? <laughs> so I picked, this is one that I've completed that's already good to go here. You can see calibration report band 20, 1020. Demo 3, we see that it's uploaded here now. And if we go up to the top right-hand corner here and hit Save, the page is going to go ahead and reload here. And we can see if we scroll down, all of our fields for all the values here are filled in. Everything is synced and fall into place nice and neat. And everything is good to go and complete it uh, when we are out in the field. And so, um, one thing now that we see here that wasn't here before was the change log. So this is getting at another feature of our robust chain of custody built in. So you can see, you know, we uploaded our uh, offline form. That is the original entry into this report, and it's, you know, the original information and data. Now, if I was ever to go back in and make a change after the fact, uh, let's just say we changed our filter temperature. It was 26. Actually, I just misread that. You know, maybe it actually was 24. After all, you can see that instantly we have a note here that I changed it. You know, the particular user changed the particular field from the original value to the new value with the current date and time. So again, this is going to keep track of that chain of custody as either you know from a manager's perspective or maybe as a data QC or data scientist. You're always going to know, be able to trace back the different values in these reports or really any of the other fields uh, within ESIM. So uh, one thing I want to mention here before moving on and sort of kind of what the wrap up would be here in this sort of field, field scenario is that most agencies have a process where field staff must review and approve uh, field activities before the data becomes final. So whether you're a field manager wanting to make sure that the items were completed or as a data QC staff you want to go ahead and QC the data and prepare it for AQS the middle is this assign report section here. So as a field operator, let's just pretend that I want to, you know, I've completed this report, I want to go ahead and assign it to my manager. I could go here into this reviewer section. Let's just say drop down. Let's just pretend that Marcus Hilton is my manager. I could pick this out, enter some comments and say calibration complete, ready for review. Or when I do, I hit update here. This is going to send an email notification to Marcus, letting him know that, hey, this report is ready for review. And within the email, it's going to include any comments in this comment section, as well as a link to the actual report itself. So then Marcus can go ahead, sign into eSIMS, review the report, and get a sense of, of what's going on immediately. And what happens is Marcus will go through and, and go through and check and start his approval process. We can just pretend that we're Marcus now. We're the field manager looking through this completed report. And he says, oh, wait a second, Justin. You forgot to fill out all these fields here. You must have missed this, or what happened, or why is this data missing? So in that case, Marcus would go through, check the further action required checkbox, pick out my name out of the drop-down list, and then enter a comment for me and say, see 
has found section missing items. Oops. Oh, exactly. Missing items. And then he hits the update button. And then that sends the email notification back to me and it becomes a volley back and forth between field staff, field operators, and the management team until the data become final. And so moving one step ahead of that, uh, whether you're a uh, kind of data QC scientist or you're working with AQS Committal or anything like that, we also have an additional um, Git PDF or Git CSV. You can actually download this completed report and any one of these items here, either for safe, safekeeping, if you want to have a hard copy backup on site at your office, or if you want to get a CSV for any sort of data review or data analysis, uh, you can go ahead and get a copy of that here. If we click on this, this pulls up a nice report here. We can see all these completed values and you know we can go ahead and file this away if we want to have just a hard copy. And we can see here our further action required and bold letters, red bold here. We know that, hey, you know, this report maybe isn't finalized yet. Let's just hold off before we make this, you know, more of an official record. Okay. So moving on really quickly here, uh, the next section would be the query. So maybe as a field operator or, again, as a data QC manager, we want to come in and take a quick peek at some of our more historical reports. So this will allow us to search through any completed reports from the past. We just leave this default and click query here. We can see we have the site, the date of the event, the task, the inventory, and then who completed the site. We also have the option to export it as, again, as a PDF or CSV from this field here. So if you wanted to go through, you could run your mouse down and, and download a bunch of reports pretty quickly. If you wanted to wrap up uh, you know, after a week or if you wanted to go ahead and do more of a larger data analysis project. But you also notice these little red icons next to each one of these items. And this corresponds to the certain status of the report against, again, approval needed or if it's further action required. So again, these are handy references to use for all staff to indicate we know the current status of the report. And then uh, kind of dipping back into our scenario base, here we have the resources section. And here's where you can upload an unlimited number of resources of any kind. So if you want to upload an SOP or manuals or tips or tricks or any kind of network information, uh, you know, these are great to have out in the field, right? So if you're trying to troubleshoot an instrument or you want to look up a part number or you want to check out a certain procedure, you can pull up the, you know, the manual here at your fingertips. And again, this is going to be super for our new staff for us to learn in the ropes. Or as a manager, you want to ensure that your team is following the correct guidelines. You know, all that information is going to be here with an ESIN. To come full circle and jump back here to the scheduler, the scheduler here is just going to be a calendar view of all the planned activities happening throughout the network. You can see that this here defaults to my user base. And so we can, I can see all the activities that I have scheduled. So I can come in and you know, pretty much check out my schedule. But as a manager, let's just say I want to check out the high priority items. And so I can search for just high items. You can see here that we have just a couple repairs scheduled. If I click on this, I can find out more information about our particular site, inventory, who the technician is, and what's really going on at site. <clears throat> so that really wraps up the software demo we had planned. And again, I know that was sort of a, a quick demo and you know, roughly 30 minutes. So we're going to jump back into the PowerPoint presentation. We just have a few more slides before we jump into our questions and answers section. So as I'm uh, pivoting back, feel free to jot down some more questions or start uh, entering them into the questions box, and we'll have time, it looks like, to go ahead and address those here at the very end. So what I wanted to uh, flickle back on really quickly here is our e-logform library. So I had mentioned that we've been building this library over the past year or so to really dial in these forms. And this list here really just shows all of the um, current items that we have. Uh, uh, one second here, just doing some logistics stuff. Um, so this item here, this page here, really just shows all the current uh, instruments that we have covered in these things. But keep in mind that these forms are customizable. 
and they can grow. So if you don't see your particular instrument covered here or there's a certain process that we're not um, getting in the system yet, keep in mind that those can be built into the system. And additionally, to help with the whole transition process is that these forms can be built to look and feel just like the forms you're look, working with now. So whether it's a paper logbook or it's Access or Excel, we can build these forms to look identical. And so that'll help the field staff with the transition process of going to an e-logbook system and definitely from the managerial perspective that there's not a whole lot of pushback from staff and that they can still continue their day-to-day -day operations as they normally would. And just a few more key benefits here that I want to talk about is that now that we know that we've seen the system is that we all know there are key tasks that must occur at a required frequency to keep your instruments in check and follow EPA requirements. So now that we've seen the scheduler tool, you have this visibility across all the required, anticipated, and urgent activities in the network, and really you can make sure no tasks fall through the cracks. So you can pretty much drop in all of your required calibrations, maintenance, audits, uh, you know, six months out and have those, you know, on the calendar, on the docket, teed up, ready to go, so you always know that the appropriate action and procedures are going to be completed. And, you know, you saw the e-logbook feature, and so now you have this rapid documentation of field activities or really immediate feedback and assigning reports to managers or any sort of data staff or data QC staff. And the last bullet here is storing decades of knowledge from experienced staff. You know, we have that resources section where all the, you know, um, guys that have been working for 10, 20 years who have all this really good field knowledge can preserve that with SFPs and manuals and tech notes, and it ensures the consistency and really can embed their knowledge in the ESIMS experience for all the upcoming newcomers. The idea is here that all these features together all the benefits, all of the software as a service features that we have are really aimed to reduce their operating costs and improve your efficiencies in, your, in the network. And just to go back that everything and everyone is going in this direction of an electronic platform, that you can be the one to really push your network into the next generation and really bring this uh, sort of to the next monitoring uh, you know, decade here. So, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Brian. He's got a couple slides to uh, discuss about the sort of pricing and format of ESIM, and then we'll reserve the last 10 minutes here for questions and answers. Okay, thank you, Justin. I hope everybody enjoyed uh, the software demo. I think I've seen that. I, well, I can't count how many times I've seen that, and it still gets me excited to see what it can do. Um, okay, so. I just wanted to kind of wrap up with, a, with just a couple of slides here really uh, describing and providing you information on uh, how our eSIMS process and service uh, would work. Um, so really to start out, um, we, we want to, and I, this is probably a question on everybody's mind as, as, as rightfully so, is, is costs, right? Uh, pricing of the system. So uh, we've designed the system um, to be based, the costing of the system to be based off of the size of your network. Um, so regardless of the number of uh, actual pieces of, of equipment you have within a site, so an Encore site versus uh, just a standard uh, ozone site it are, are going to be on the same level. Um, so we really designed it based off of the size of the network and, and really I think uh, the best way to proceed going forward is uh, get in contact with us. Uh, we can discuss some of the details uh, of your network. Um, and the service quote that would be based off of that, as well as any additional um, ideas you have for, for features that you would like to see, or talking about some, some incentive programs that we have based off of. Uh, um, okay, so once you kind of have an idea of, uh, of your cost, and you, we, we work with you to kind of get a, a service quote in place, and hopefully a contract in place, Really, the, the next stage of this, and uh, and it can be uh, one that's that's really important, is is making that transition, um, uh, moving from your existing system uh, to to the eSIMS uh, e logbook system. So what we've done is we've developed really kind of a suite of services that we hope and we we have seen 
uh, make that transition really as smooth as possible. So that's going to include uh, things like establishing your, your agency accounts, your user profiles, getting everybody signed up within eSIMS. Uh, we're going to ingest all of your site information, all of your equipment information, uh, collect all of your SOPs that you want to load into, into, the, into the system. Um, we're going to link all of your sites with your equipment, so everything Justin had just shown in the document in the, in the demonstration on the sites that have the associated equipment uh, with them, as well as uh, the forms that you want to associate with each piece of equipment. Uh, we provide uh, simple system modifications really to, to try to tailor the system to meet your needs. So uh, in particular, uh, we, we focus on if there are different things, different types of uh, naming conventions that you use that maybe are a little bit different in eSIMS. Those are easy, easy changes that we can make that just help kind of push the system to be more representative of what you're currently using. And the other thing that we've seen with the simple system modifications that I think is particularly useful is, is working with our form library. And Justin alluded to kind of the extensive form library that we do have, uh, have in-house. And really what's nice about that is, uh, and what we've seen to date is, uh, for the most part, the forms that we have within our library really meet the agency's needs. Uh, however, there might be a couple forms that, uh, just a couple quick, simple uh, tweaks and modifications, maybe even name changes, or the format of the form, or or a couple different parameters that maybe we don't have in our forms that you wanna that you wanna capture. We can we can build off of our existing form library to to tailor uh, the forms that really uh, meet your needs. So essentially, the idea is uh, the forms that you're using, whether they be in Excel or or any type of standalone application, the the format, the layout, the calculations that you have built in, we can take those forms and build them directly into the eSIMS uh, library so they look and feel exactly as they would before. So it's just that easier transition, uh, so especially for your field staff that are, that are going into a new system, but the, the forms that they're, they've been using for you know, countless, countless times are going are gonna to look and feel uh, as they did before. Um, and then, of course, as part of this process, we're going to provide the necessary training uh, for your staff to get really up, up to speed with eSIMS. Um, and that's really, really our goal is to, to, to make that transition as smooth as, po smooth as possible. So uh, just one note uh, before moving on. Uh, so this, this period really, there's no, there's no timetable connected to this period. Uh, we've seen agencies that want to try to uh, do as much uh, within the first Month, a couple months of, of, of a contract to get this going and get it operational as quick as possible. But for the most part, we, what we're seeing is um, using this transition period to, um, to really build up the, 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 the different uh, changes and the different schemes and technology um, within their staff to really um, push, push the system um, to a point where everybody is comfortable using it uh, in a in a testing in a in a uh, uh, testing mode um, before they they really go out and use it operationally. So uh, we've seen quite a bit of, of differences in in how agencies want to go about this transition program. Uh, all of which we can work with you to to really kind of tailor that to to meet your needs. Okay, and then lastly, once once you are up and going and it's operational. Um, we're going to provide a lot of the things that are connected to the EPA guidance document, uh, the routine backups and security, uh, technical phone support that, that is available uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, you'll have access, as Justin alluded to, you'll have access to pre-training videos. So coming on board in the middle of the year uh, and they need to get up to speed with eSIMS really, you know, kind of a, in a more uh, efficient manner. Uh, they have access to these videos as well as the other training materials that we that we would provide to get them up to speed. And then, and then again, we have you have access to the ongoing feature enhancements, and those are feature enhancements that will be coming into the system um, uh, by STI, uh, as well as ideas coming from other agencies uh, joining the system that uh, might have a, a tool or a feature that maybe we haven't thought about yet that they. They want they are using and they want to use and they want built built into the system. All of the feature enhancements that go into the system, regardless if they are 
uh, funded by STI as part of the normal uh, upgrades and, and enhancements to the system, or if they're funded by specific clients wanting to get features into the system to, to meet their needs, all of those features are available to everybody within the system with no additional costs. So that, that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of how the, uh, the transition and the, the program would work. And again, um, we, can, we can talk offline. You can, uh, you can contact us directly, and we can put together a, a service call relatively uh, quick on, on, to, on specifically related to your network uh, and any ideas you might have uh, for, for making this um, a, a more streamlined and efficient process. Um, okay, so I think that actually wraps up our uh, presentation. So the idea here was to, looks like we have a, a, a good list of questions that people have been asking uh, throughout the webinar. So I think the idea here is Justin and I will, will start uh, kind of tackling some of these questions and, and answer as many as we can within the next five or ten minutes or so. And then any that we that we don't get to, uh, we're going to make available to you um, as well as the recording of the webinar uh, within the next couple days. Um, so you can share that with the folks, the API folks that were unable to attend uh, that want to uh, get more information on on eSIMS. Um, okay, so with that, um, we'll uh, I'm going to let Justin drive here, and uh, we're going to scroll through some questions and see what we can get answered for you. All right. Okay, so let's start with, uh, here we go. Sorry, we're scrolling through here. Okay, so uh, Carl Thompson from South Coast asks, can inventory be imported from, say, a set spreadsheet, or does it have to be entered by hand so part of the onboarding process uh, and, and coming on to eSIMS, you could send us a spreadsheet of all of your equipment and the entire network, and we would go ahead and take care of that for you. And that's, again, part of sort of getting the system prepped for you, getting your log formats ready to go, getting your equipment in the network, and that would make it easier for you as well as for staff training and just, you know, relieving the burden to enter in, you know, hundreds of different pieces of equipment. So right, so right, you could just send us a spreadsheet and we'd be able to go ahead and take care of that for you. Uh, Carl also asked that if or if anybody is using eSIMS as a lab notebook system, or is anybody doing it right now? And uh, right now, not to our knowledge, no one is using it that way, but we actually see that as being a possibility and that building in another component, uh, a lab section component, whether it be with different forms for different, any kind of filter checks, uh, or things like that, and and it certainly can be expanded to include all those procedures, and we would work with you to make sure that we have the right order of operations and everything built into eSIMS to cover that procedure for you. But yeah, we we we've had some some mentions of that, and we can definitely see eSIMS going in that direction uh, as we move forward. Elaine from Ventura County FECD asked. Um, or mentioned that having a login and password by individual user that is date and time stamped, isn't that sufficient enough for electronic signature? So that's what we felt too, is we felt that, you know, just by logging in and documenting that, if that would work and be sufficient for EPA, or do we need to go ahead and have an e-signature on every single individual report? And the overall goal with e-signatures is to make sure the data are Legal, legally defensible in court, right? So, um, you know, if a, a simple login, you know, that, that checks off as an e-signature or signatures by managers on individual reports, you know, this is going to bring in multiple users. That's really sort of the nitty-gritty details that we're after. So, uh, you all, if, if you have heard any information that would be useful for us about that, uh, we're all, we're all, we are all ears. Okay. More questions here. I'm going to expand this to be a little bit bigger. Oh, perfect. So Melinda asked a question, and this may have been before the software demonstration. 
uh, just sort of talking about uh, when reviewing and QCing reports and site and equipment information, um, but maybe have some questions and being able to add notes to, to different reports uh, and you know, sending in a bunch of different separate emails and you know checking out different versions of the same file in different places at around 1040 so for demo so yeah willing to kind of circle back on that um, that's sort of what we'll be getting at when we go through the assigned report approval process for the field operator can assign that report to various staff for the QA staff or managers and begin that volley process back and forth. And that's where that comment section comes into play as far as adding additional notes or if you wanted to upload additional attachments, um, you could do that there as well. So that's sort of the idea about covering that particular process of Ethan. And then Linda, you also mentioned a little later on, closer to 11, that it must have been hard to see the screen or it was really tiny font during the demo. So we'll make sure that when we export this, you know, we're recording this webinar, that we can post that either on the eSIMS website or we'll send it out to all of you and that they'll hopefully be able to review it and, and be able to see it that way. And again, if that still doesn't work, we're happy to do a one-on-one -on -one demo with you again and, and run through anything that you may want to see over again and ensure that you're able to see the full scope here. Okay, so Philip Harrison asks, does eSIMS track the flow of the calibration device used in calibration? So um, on those reports, there was an option there to, to where you would enter in the value for the reference device. So of course you're going to track and plug in the uh, BAM reference, or excuse me, the BAM value, but for your reference device, your handheld device, that all information is also tracked. And you can also view that in that handy dandy chart uh, to see, you know, to make sure that the handheld has been has been trending properly over time too as well. So that'll be our feature uh, included in these things into those e-log forms. So Dallas Caldwell asks, how many different levels are there? I might be able to use much more basic, uh, I think probably a much more basic version of eSIMS. So in our discussions with California ARB, they also have the same comment that there's kind of a lot jam-packed in here and that maybe we really want to use this for a couple of the features and not sort of the full nine yards. Maybe we don't need all these different inventory tracking features and things like that. And right now we've built sort of one version and that's more to keep it universal across the board that no matter what agency or no matter what role you play in the, in the agency that you have access to any of these tools. So Dallas, Dallas, if you're interested in more of a stripped down basic version, you know, we can continue those discussions on our end over here and see if that's something that we would be interested in. Um, and really, I know we kind of flew through that demo in a half an hour, but really, you know, sitting down at a computer within a couple hours, Ethan was you know, it was relatively intuitive and that I really feel that you would be able to get the hang of it in just a half a day and that it really doesn't take too much time to get up and running. And with our training, we really tried to uh, kind of get that across that it's, it's scary at first. I remember the first time I saw Air Now Tech and pretty much fell off my chair, but I think um, that that would be something that we could discuss internally and figure out if that's something that we would want to consider making a more stripped down version. Okay, so we're getting, uh, it's just about, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just about 11.30, uh, so we're coming to the end of our webinar. So like uh, uh, like I said before, uh, the webinar recording will be made available via our website, uh, and we will send out a note to the, the, the registries, or register um, attendees here on, on when, um, when that is posted, as well as a full list of, of the questions and answers that we've seen uh, here. Um, so I think with that, uh, we're going to uh, wrap up our presentation. I want to thank everybody for uh, sticking with us for the last hour and a half. Um, and again, if you have any additional questions or want to receive more information on eSIMS or want to have more information or discussions on uh, the EPA guidance document, please don't hesitate to uh, give us a call or email us at the contact information shown uh, on this screen. 
And I think with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap up the presentation. And, and uh, thank you. And I hope everybody has uh, a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.